Hello. In sub-Saharan Africa, many countries are making considerable progress towards the vision of a democratic, prosperous, and a peaceful continent as outlined in African Union's Agenda 2063. However, this progress is hindered by high levels of corruption in form of political corruption, misappropriation of natural resources, and corrupt policies that are intertwined with state fragility of the country. Earlier this year, Transparency International, a global coalition against corruption, released their annual report on the public sector of corruption countries. The Gambia scored 37 points out of 100, which according to the report is an improvement of 7 points from 30 points in the previous year. This progress may be credited to the positive consequences of legal, policy and institutional reforms carried out by the current leaders and the will of the people in the fight against corruption from the years of it by the regime of Yahya Abdul Aziz Jameh. At age 29, Lieutenant Yahya Abdul Aziz Jameh, having attended four months of police training at Fort McLaren in Alabama, together with three junior army officers, led a successful bloodless coup d'etat on the 22nd of July 1994. The coup was against the government of Sir Dauda Jawara, who was accused of corruption and misuse of public office. He later fled the country into exile. With the success of the coup, the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council was formed on the 26th of July 1994, with Yahya Jame serving as chairman and president from 1994 to 1996. The council promised the people that this would be a coup with a difference, and the civilian rule would be handed over to the public once things were set right. This promise was never fulfilled and the people of Gambia had to wait for 22 years of dictatorship and brutality of Jame and his friends, which earned him international recognition. Yaya was one of Africa's most eccentric dictators. He was known for intimidating and sometimes killing dissidents, particularly students and journalists. He proclaimed at a gathering of diplomats that his special mix of herbs could cure HIV and AIDS, infertility, asthma, obesity, and erectile dysfunction. When asked to share the concoction in the herbs, he said, Coca-Cola cannot give him. If you addressed Yahya Jame, he preferred to be called His Excellency, Sheikh, Professor, and Hajj Dr. Yahya Abdul Aziz Jamas Jamkung Jame. Though it is unclear what formal background or clerical education allowed the former army man to proclaim himself as a Sheikh Professor. There is so much that can be said about Jame's role from his abuse of human rights to violence, which will be addressed in later episodes. But for today, we will focus on how he looted close to 850,000 US dollars per week, amounting to close to a billion dollars from the Gambia during his 22 year rule. The Gambia is a country located in the western part of Africa, surrounded by Senegal, with a population of fewer than 2 million people. It is also the smallest country in mainland Africa, with an economy largely dependent on peanuts, farming, fishing, and tourism. The Gambia's GDP was also less than a billion dollars during Jame's rule. With Yahya as president, he ran a country like an organized crime syndicate. As president, he had major control of money in and out of the Gambia, and no one dared to question him. 
If they did, they were punished by arrests, torture, or even made to disappear. The presidential salary was only 6,000 US dollars per month, but one wonders how he acquired this massive wealth, with estimates of him looting close to 970 million US dollars during his 22 year rule. The major casualty of his looting spree was the Central Bank of Gambia, which he treated as his personal slash fund. Jamez cronies were known to shove suitcases filled with major currencies, including pounds, euros, and dollars into waiting vehicles to be flown and taken to his personal accounts, both domestic and overseas. Over a few years, he diverted 71 million US dollars from the central bank's reserves. He pulled off the central bank heists through hijacking the bank's accounts, using dormant accounts, and creating new accounts on which he and his chosen cronies were sole signatories. Jamie couldn't stop stealing from the central bank that many of his accounts went into overdraft by withdrawing cash from these accounts despite knowing that they had no funds left in them. During this period, the Central Bank of Gambia was highly indebted, and in 2015 they wrote a letter to the IMF claiming that it was due to overlending to the government and violation of its own rules. To this day, the bank remains in a terrible position owing lenders 130% of its GDP as a result of external areas incurred by the Yahya administration. Rosewood is an endangered and rare timber widely used for antique style furniture, especially in Asia and in particular China. This rare valuable wood is cherished for its color and durability and is not found in the forests of Gambia. However, Gambia is among the five largest exporters of rosewood, despite declaring its own stock close to extinction a decade ago. But during Yahya's rule, the Gambia exported hundreds of millions of dollars worth of rosewood. Yahya found rosewood in Kamasan's region in neighboring Senegal, a region that is home to the Jola ethnic group to which Yahya belongs. So this gave him strong ties to the region, enabling him to defraud this area. With the acquisition of this region, he formed a partnership with two Romanians, creating a monopoly on illegal timber exports, allowing them major control of illegal rosewood trade. Together with the Romanians, he became the co-owner of Westwood Gambia Limited Company, and the fear of persecution emerged when anyone challenged the monopoly of that company. The timber was mostly exported to China, where a ton of rosewood could be sold for as much as 20,000 US dollars. In total, 325 million US dollars of illegal timber went through Gambia's ports from 2010 to 2016. Most of the rosewood had been illegally smuggled into the Gambia from Senegal. None of the money acquired from the sale of rosewood was put back either in Senegal or the Gambia to benefit the people of those countries and regions. The Gambia's pension fund was not spared by Yahya's looting tentacles, diverting at least 60 million US dollars from the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation between 2010 and 2014. This was hard earned money from civil servants, soldiers, and the private sector, earning less than $534 per year. At this stage, Jamie had started stealing from the country's future before he could even leave power. Furthermore, a company called Gam Petroleum Gambia Company, which is linked to Yahya's crony, a Lebanese businessman and Hezbollah financer, Muhammad Bazi, received 60 million in funds from the pension fund, thus benefiting from many of Yahya's corrupt schemes to steal from the Gambia. The Gambia received more than a hundred million US dollars of aid and soft loans between 1995 to 2015 from Taiwan, making it one of the country's largest bilateral donors. As soon as the money was deposited onto the accounts, Yahya Jame withdrew 24 million US dollars in cash from this aid, then sent 20 million to foreign shell companies belonging to his cronies that included Global Trading Group and TK Motors. As a result of this theft, China and Taiwan reached an informal agreement in 2008 to stop exchanging aid for recognition. Eventually, Yahya cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan in 2013, when Taiwan's aid dried up completely. However, in 2016, China broke its agreement with Taipei and resumed sending aid to the Gambia. Having looted from the Gambian pension fund an illegal export of rosewood, he still further most stole from the state telecom company. The formation of these companies enabled him to steal 55.2 million US dollars from the state-run oil company too. 
He used, Jame used some of the money to build himself a lavish palace in his hometown of Kanilai. Complete with a farm, tanks, jungle warfare training camp, private mosque, and a zoo housing exotic animals like parrots, zebras, hyenas, and camels. At the mansion, he held annual beauty pageants in which mainly female university students would compete for a university scholarship or a trip abroad. It was established that Jame owned 280 properties in the country, and the investigators also found that the former leader's assets in his hometown of Kanilai alone were worth 28.2 million US dollars. His family greatly benefited from the looted money, where his children attended expensive boarding schools in Manhattan, USA, with annual fees of 40,000 US dollars per year. His wife would go for luxury monthly shopping sprees abroad, where she used private jets to fly for this occasion. She was often seen buying tubs of mayonnaise and ketchup, which was Jame's favorite condiments that he couldn't get in the Gambia. To ensure the safety of his family when visiting the USA, he purchased a 3.5 million mansion in Portmark, Maryland from a retired NBA player which his wife used as a base to buy mayonnaise and ketchup. In a tribute to Mike Jackson in 2010 after the singer's death, he held a concert where his brother Jeremiah Jackson performed. Jamie's spending heated at his riches. He had a fleet of black Rolls Royce limousines whose headrests carried his name embroidered in the dark thread. According to his former lobbyist, John A. Koth, while Jamie was on a trip to New York for a UN summit in 2002, he witnessed one million US dollars in cash in a cellophane wrapping brought to Jamie's hotel room. He bought expensive watches and tipped the dentist 20,000 US dollars. Other spendings were designed to portray Jamie as a benevolent, generous ruler, but not typically in ways that benefited the ordinary Gambians. He engaged in ostentatious giveaways to poor people, which included iPhones, laptops, iPads, and sewing machines. In 2016, Jame lost an election to the rival, Adama Barrow, and was called on to step down. He initially considered but later changed his mind and rejected the result, alleging serious and unacceptable abnormalities in the process. I'm, I'm calling you to wish you all the best. The Gambian people have spoken and I have no reason to contest the will of the Almighty Allah. Hey. Hello? Are you hearing me? I wish you all the best on your, uh, your transition. I don't mean uh, selecting who becomes member of government. But you have to work with me as I pack to go to Kanila so that I hand over the state house to you. You are the elected president of the Gambia, and I wish you all the best. I have no uh, ill will, and I wish you all the best. After a month-long standoff and under pressure from the West African heads of state, Jamie eventually conceded and left the country to another kleptocratic nation, Extoria Gini. He was accompanied by a cargo plane stuffed with luxuries including at least three luxury cars. However, another fleet of vehicles including several Rolls Royces with Jame's name embroidered in their red headdresses, were left behind on the tarmac and three planes. These were sold off to reduce on a mountain of crippling debt contracted during the authoritarian leader's decades-long rule. The US and the UK slapped sanctions on Jamie for human rights abuses and corruption. His wife Zainab faced the same sanctions for supporting Jamie's corruption. She was believed to control many of the overseas assets of her husband and utilized a charitable foundation and charities as a cover to facilitate the illicit transfer of funds to her husband. To avoid any dictator trace of the money he stole, he always withdrew the money in cash and that's why the amount of loot can never be known or recovered to this day. But the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project put the estimates of 970 million US dollars, meaning that he stole 850,000 US dollars per week from the Gambian people. Transparency International faulted the US and the UK banks for helping the corrupt and oppressive regime. The banks facilitated Jamie's theft of public monies in and out of the Gambia, while he violently oppressed his people and destroyed the country's economy. Some of the world's biggest banks, including Barclays, Citibank, HSBC Bank, and Standard Chartered, were alleged to have approved the transactions that facilitated Jamie's embezzling of state funds and by failing to conduct sufficient due diligence. To this day, 
Some of the money he stole, he uses to facilitate his lavish lifestyle in exile in Equatoria Guinea, in company of another dictator, Pietro Obiang Ngema Basogo, who has been in power for 41 years. Thank you for listening and subscribe for more content.